Welcome to the, uh, the Old Sydney Society meeting, the first of uh, 2016. <clears throat> and you know, uh, this is our 50th anniversary of giving these historical talks. And uh, Bob Morgan said when they started out in the beginning, they were always worried that they were never going to get enough people. And uh, so uh, we never seem to have any problem because of the uh, generosity of our speakers who give of their time freely and are willing to uh, share their knowledge. And you know why we've uh, survived for 50 years? Because of people like you who come out to support us. If you weren't here and you didn't come to our museum openings and to our historical talks, we wouldn't exist. So the support that we get from you, like a $10 membership, uh, it's very important because your name goes on the list and when we uh, when we look for things, the first thing they check is, well, how many members do they have? So it's very important for us to see that we have uh, public support and public commitment. So thank you for coming out and supporting us. Tonight, we're very fortunate to have a first-rate speaker, Andy Parnaby. He was on um, Main Street yesterday evening, which I thought was an incredible interview, playing William Roach was just a great radio, effective. And uh, Andy's a very powerful and clear speaker. And uh, it's gonna be good. But I also, besides singling out Main Street, I wanna thank the Cape Breton Post. The Cape Breton Post and CBC are both very good to us. And of course, we use all the social media as well. So tonight, Andy is gonna speak on Counterfeit principles of a free enterprise system, the Anti-Kiddish movement, and the Sydney Steel Crisis of 1967 in Sydney. Andy is an associate professor at uh, at the university. He's very committed to the community, and uh, you can see it tonight. He's volunteering his time. Please give him a warm welcome. Thanks very much, Ken. It's always um uh, it's always a delight to be a part of these events. Um, for me, they're a bit like, um, like an old home week. Uh, I see lots of faces that I recognize, that I, that I work with, uh, friends of, of neighbors and, and colleagues. So it's always, it's always just a great audience, and uh, it's always such a delight to, to, to speak to the old, uh, the old Sydney Society. Uh, I have a, a, quick, a quick thank you, and it's uh, to the Beaton Institute at Cape Breton University. 99% uh, of the material, the images, and some of the text is drawn from that archive. Um, I've worked in archives in Canada, the United States, and in the UK, and I can say just from experience, it is one of the best, most richest, eclectic collections I've ever, I've ever had the privilege of working in. Uh, events like this and some of the stories I'm going to tell are, are possible because those, those resources exist. And uh, they need to be strong, they need to be well-staffed, they need to be supported. So, uh, because they've certainly supported my scholarship and the scholarship of others, like, like you know, Ken Donovan, his colleagues, uh, Sandy Balcom, uh, others like Don McGilvery and Elizabeth Beaton. This, these are the historians that continually tell us stories that, that entertain us and, and keep us whole as a, as a community. And they happen because we have the resources. So I'm indebted to the Beaton as our previous generations it's important we realize what a, what a real gem we have up there on, on Grand Lake Road. Um, maybe the best place to start is with a, a bit of a disclaimer. Um, and that disclaimer is that I come to this research project as an outsider. Uh, I'm not from the island. I have no family connections here, although my, my kids are, are born here, and I think that may count for something. Uh, and, I mean, it's a sort of a dumb anecdote, but I, I remember one of the first times someone asked me who my father was, my first response, my thought was, okay, what has he done? Uh, uh, I, I realize now that it's, a, it's an invitation just to, to locate yourself uh, in the context of the people that you're with. It's, a, it's an invitation. Uh, it's not an allegation, uh, necessarily. Um, that, I mention that outsider status simply because um, when you're an outsider, and you come to study an event and a group of people that are vital to a community, that distance gives you the ability to see the extraordinary in the ordinary. 
because it wasn't your experience. It wasn't your moment. But with that kind of space, you can see something that perhaps people who lived it or have been told about it their entire lives, maybe they don't quite see the extraordinary in the ordinary. Maybe they do, but maybe they don't. So I'm an outsider, but I see some, uh, some benefits um, to that status. Well, let's, let's do some time travel. And uh, let's wind the clock back to... Um, to I wish I could. Uh, uh, I thought getting older would take longer. It's, it uh, let's, let's wind the clock back to Monday, the 16th of October, 1967. Uh, and imagine ourselves in this, the, the house that's on the screen uh, behind me. It's just, it would have been just across the road. And I want you to imagine a, a Monday morning meeting that involves uh, George Topshi, uh, Andy Hogan, uh, Bill Roach, uh, and others. I should say, just as a, as, as a footnote, the stories that I found are the ones that I found in documents and objects. I suspect many of you here tonight have stories all your own. They're just between your ears. So the story that I present, I don't present it as the only story. It might not even be the best story, but it's the one I found in the documentary evidence. And so if there's any point in time where you, you just want to you want to fill in some blanks or ask a question or even challenge what I have to say, don't feel like you have to hold back. I don't, um, I actually have more fun when I'm not looking at, at, at my notes. So if something comes to mind and you just want to get it out there, that's great. I mean, we can, we can just have some fun with that. I'm not stuck to, uh, to, a, to an order here. So let's get back to this, the, the, this structure. It's Monday, uh, the 16th of October, and that morning meeting is all about the crisis. And you know the crisis that I'm talking about. Because just the Friday before was the Black Friday announcement heard on uh, CJCB that, that Hawker Sidley would pull out of Sydney uh, imminently. It would have been by the spring. And that Monday morning meeting typically would have been about sports scores, daily activities, a variety of projects. But this time it fell into a single groove and it stayed there. What are we going to do? Now, I think the people in that office knew that they would have to throw their weight behind uh, any kind of community campaign to save Sydney Steel. As a historian, um, um, thinking through this event, I was actually quite surprised by it. I didn't readily understand why a clutch of activist priest professors uh, thought that they would have had the presence or the legitimacy to, to lead such a movement. I started scratching my head, well, who are these individuals? Where did they come from? And how is it that it's they, and not, say, the union leaders or somebody else, leading the crusade? I mean, it's a tremendous moment. I don't know how many of you were here when it happened, if, if just the recollections uh, put you in a certain kind of frame of mind, but, but it's a big deal. Uh, this, this slide doesn't do it justice, but the the, the, the typeset, this is the front page of the Cape Breton Post, the typeset is actually the size that you'd expect with the declaration of war or the announcement of peace. It is, it is big. And in fact, the, the war metaphors continue, right? A bombshell. It's not a tremor or a, or a dispute or, or it's, it's a bombshell. And this, this is why we have people in the uh, extension office across the street thinking about what they're going to do next. Now, I was surprised to see who was involved and what they eventually do. So the mystery for me became, who are these people, where did they come from, and why are they leading this particular movement? Now, this history is probably familiar to many of you, and you probably recognize the individuals on this slide here. On the left is Jimmy Tompkins in 1907, his faculty portrait from St. FX, and on the right is Moses Cody. These are the two founders of the Antigonish movement, uh, uh, and they are sort of a towering influence right down to the 1950s. Um, they had different skills, different abilities, different approaches, but they were both committed to that basic principle of adult education, of, of cooperative enterprise, and as Jimmy Tompkins once said, ideas that had marrow in them. So not to, and he, he's got this one line, he said, 
why spend $1,000 on a fossilized education from a university when the real ideas with marrow in them are on the wharves, they're at the pit head, they're, on, they're at the farms. Now these individuals, plus a plethora of others, and these are just two, men and women, are responsible for the cooperative movement. And it goes from strength to strength to strength in the 1920s into the 1930s. Hundreds of cooperative canneries, cooperative banks, uh, cooperative uh, distribution centers. This is, this is their strength. And I knew that story. I, I, I knew who these people were. But remember, the crisis is an urban crisis of the working class and of steel. What do we know about that side of the experience? The truth is, there isn't much out there uh, on that particular element of it. So I started to think about this. How do I understand the role of the Antigonish movement, which for me is associated with rural cooperatives? How do we uh, tell that story and, and, and what are its chapters? Well, first it means thinking through the relationship between the Antigonish movement on the one hand and uh, the urban workers of Sydney, but also of New Waterford and Glace Bay, uh, the north side, uh, on the other hand. What happens when we bring these two together? Well, like any historian, I decided to go back in time. And I went looking for evidence of a building re of a relationship. And what I found was quite mysterious. I found it quite mysterious at first. I had one letter from Jimmy Tompkins, 1920. He's writing to the bishop in Antigonish and he says, you know what, the labor movement in, in industrial Cape Breton is so radical it's scary. And you should think long and hard about getting involved, doing something to kind of bevel those hard edges off that labor. He's writing 1920s, right? This is those, it's the time period of, well, it's a, it's a labor war. Fast forward to the 1950s. I find another letter. It's in the National Archives in Ottawa. It's written by Moses Cody, and he's writing to the United Steelworkers of America, their head office. And it's basically a Christmas card. And he says, thank you for your donation this year. I love you guys. We, we march shoulder to shoulder. We've always stood together for the greater good. So I have these two letters, 1920, 1954, three or four. And my thought is, okay, what's happened in between? Well, the short answer is a deepening relationship between, on the one hand, the uh, Antigonish movement operating through the extension department here in the North End, uh, and the labor movement on the other. They, they slowly, over time, come together. And in fact, it's several letters from Jimmy Tompkins to the Bishop of Antigonish, and he keeps saying, I'm ringing the bell here, uh, friends. There's trouble out here unless we start getting involved. And it's at that point the Bishop in Antigonish says, yes, we will extend the uh, uh, Antigonish movement to, to urban workers. We will go and we'll get involved because this is that important. So, so the result? Between the early 1930s, when uh, the cooperative movement establishes its storefront presence uh, in Sydney, in Glace Bay, New Waterford, down to the late 1950s, early 1960s, we have a deepening set of relationships of trust, uh, mutual support, and of education. And it takes a wide range of forms. Let me just give you just a few quick examples. Perhaps the easiest one is cooperative banking. Um, lots of cooperative banks are, are created in the, uh, uh, credit unions rather, are created in the industrial zones, some right at the steel plant. Management of the steel plant, the union, and the anti Ganesh movement all come together to create this one cooperative enterprise. People need low interest loans, they have to pool their savings. How else are you going to build a house? And it's remarkably successful. So here's a spot where they begin to touch, right? Other examples, and perhaps some of you even took classes or participated in the, the labor school of the air. This was broadcast on CJFX uh, uh, out of Andy Ganesh. Uh, its signal wasn't always great, it you know, bounced around a lot. Um, but they held uh, classes, many of them dedicated to labor issues and the future of industry. 
Um, students at home could, it, like a correspondence course. Uh, the convocation was held right in this building when, when you finished the course. Uh, they often brought in a guest speaker, like the head of the Canadian Labour Congress, to give the convocation address. Uh, I don't know everybody in this image, but I think on the far right, that's Alan J. McKechn, um, right, right over here. Uh, he was a faculty member at St. FX, uh, went there, you know, coal miner's son from the west side of the island, uh, goes, to, goes to St. FX during the, really the heyday of, of, of the influence of the Antigonish movement. And of course, we know he goes off to federal politics. Um, his maiden speech in Parliament, he cites uh, the Antigonish movement as a formative influence. So the, the echoes of its impact are being felt in other places too. A few other examples to give you a sense for the deepening relationship between the cooperative movement on the one hand and the labor movement on the other. Uh, this is a, a meeting of uh, the Steelworkers Union, local 1064. Uh, this is held in Sydney. This is in the 1950s. Uh, you can't see, but extension workers, so Antigonish workers, are actually on the podium speaking to the union members. Um, None of them look very happy, if you look closely at the picture. Um, I don't know if that's a, an artifact of, of the camera, like, hold, okay, hold it, and then you have to wait five minutes for the, for the film, for the image to, 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 to go, or if they're not liking what they're, I'm not really sure. There's, there's, there's one guy here mugging for the camera who I like. Uh, he's right here. Um, over here, this looks like John L. Lewis of the United Mine Workers of America. I know it's not, but it looks like him. He's got the big Brez, Brezhnev eyebrows uh, that are very similar. Um, but what's interesting here is, what do we have? We have uh, the Antigonish movement on the one hand, you know, doing cooperative education with the labor movement on the other, and this interesting dialogue between the leadership developing. There's a, a deepening level of trust here. And if we fast forward, I think we're starting to understand why we have activist priests uh, and professors leading the crusade during the uh, Sydney Steel Crisis. There's this deep, deep kind of history sitting there. Now, I would be uh, remiss if I didn't uh, uh, also highlight that uh, the Antigonish movement had a, you know, that sense early on that the, the labor movement was too radical and this is one of the things propelling them into this relationship. I'd be remiss if I didn't return to that because I think it's an important feature uh, of the entire relationship. Uh, the quote at the very top, I don't know if you can read it at the back, it's, uh, it's from a man named A.S. McIntyre. A.S. McIntyre was, uh, was a coal miner. He was J.B. McLaughlin's right-hand man during the 1925 coal strike. He's blacklisted afterwards and slowly charts a different path towards the cooperative movement. And he's actually the one who's uh, helping to set up all these credit unions in the industrial areas. Uh, by the time we get to the 1930s, he's washed his hands of the radical labor movement, and he sees the cooperative movement you know, brought by the Antigonish activists as a way to blunt that radical edge. Second quote is by uh, Reverend Michael J. Uh, McKinnon. He succeeds Moses Cody as the leader of the Extension Department. And he too sees this relationship as a way to set the labor movement on a, what they see as a much more productive and cooperative path. And the final quote is from the Sydney Post record. Again, sort of highlighting what they see as the chief benefit of this deepening kind of relationship. I, I, I like the metaphor that the Antigonish movement is cultivating the garden of Cape Breton's social endeavor and thereby ridding it of its communistic weeds. Hey, it's great writing. I, I think it's a wonderful writing. Whatever you think of the sentiment, it's a, it's, a great, uh, it's a wonderful turn of phrase. Well, that's the deep history in the 20s you know, to the 50s, let's say. And that brings us back to, back to the crisis. 1967 and the announcement by Hawker Sidley that they'll be pulling out of Sydney. By this point, the relationships between the Antigonish movement on the one hand, organized labor on the other are deep, they're long standing, uh, and they're very, very productive. Uh, this image here is uh, on the left, you'll see that's uh, uh, G.I. Smith, who is the premier of Nova Scotia at the time. Um, he had only been premier for, for a short while, uh, uh, and this sort of lands on his plate. And here he is in the face of students from Junior X who are demonstrating uh, in support of the, uh, of the, uh, of the broader community response. 
Um, there's actually a great quote in the newspaper, the editorial page. It's the chief of police in Sydney, and he says, uh, he supports the steel workers, but he's not going to tolerate hippie-like tactics from Yorkville happening in the good town of Sydney, Cape Breton. <laughs> I mean, they don't look like, look like a lot of long hairs to me. Uh, um, uh, I mean, think of San Francisco hate Ashbury, and then look at that crowd. That's that, not quite the same, but um, uh, you know, maybe this has got everybody a little bit, uh, a little bit, a little bit nervous. And what a crisis it was! It's hard for us to recall. It is for me, obviously just how massive it was. Remember, coal is starting to unwind at the same time. There's a moment in 1965 when it appears that upwards of 10,000 direct jobs will be pulled out of the industrial area alone. Could you imagine that kind of carnage in a community not responding? Uh, imagine if we woke up one day and they said, we're taking all the white collar work out of Halifax. How would Halifax respond? I would say probably in a similar kind of manner. So we have to, to understand uh, uh, how the Antigonish movement is so, uh, why they're so involved, and how they're able to drive this movement forward. Remember what the stakes are. They're truly, truly massive. Uh, and, I, you know, and frankly, I think we're still, we're still feeling the after effects. I don't think the process is over, to be honest with you. I think we're still unwinding in, in, in a way. And Cape Breton, if we think about it in broader North American terms, is on the leading edge. What happens here in the 60s eventually rolls out across North America. And it happens in places like Yonkers and Camden and Youngstown uh, uh, in Brooklyn. They go through the same thing. So it's a, in a, I guess in a sense it's a, it's a first for us, but not a first we really want to be proud of necessarily. But eventually, we get this rust belt in North America, and we see it taking hold here first. Well, what about our activist priest professors? Well, um, let's begin with this one here. Um, there are two that I'll focus on. I could have talked about others. Uh, Father, uh, Father Andy Hogan and Father uh, William Roach. Some of you uh, may have known them uh, personally. Uh, I ran into someone just today who said that uh, he knew, knew Father Andy personally. He couldn't come to the talk and had all these anecdotes uh, uh, about him. Um, Andy Hogan was the academic in this context. He never gave up on coal and steel. Uh, and it is his, his contribution really is giving people's gut level sense that the island was under siege. He gave it an intellectual framework. He said, look at the development of the country. Look how lopsided it is. Let's think about confederation, and is it a good deal or a bad deal? Remember, this is the centennial year. I've, I've interviewed a few people involved in the, in the community sort of response, and it's funny. They remember the words to let's save our industry more, more quickly than they remember that Bobby Gimby tune of Canada. It's let's save our industry that comes to mind. So that, that, even that centennial year, people are seeing, are seeing differently. Well, Hogan produced study after study, teach-ins and, 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 and public panels. Uh, he, he conducted door-to-door -door analyses of unemployment, finding that in Sydney in 1967, he estimated the unemployment rate to be 32%. That's Great Depression levels. The official rate is 7 or 8. He put it at 30 to 32. And he never gave up on the subject. On the day of Black Friday, he was actually in Halifax organizing a teach-in at the University of King's College trying to get the message out. And he was always, always attuned to the importance of region as a way to organize people's hearts and minds. It was a popular sentiment at the time. Uh, this is an image from the, the masthead of uh, the Cape Breton Highlander. Maybe some of you remember that, uh, that, that publication. Uh, and, and the Gaelic phrase there is, is basically, you know, stand tough, hold on, we're going to do this. I mean, like Hogan was on that frequency and was able to express that in a, in a more intellectual and academic way for a particular kind of audience. Well, if Hogan was the academic side, uh, Father uh, William Roach, I'd say, was the organizer. Uh, there's a really neat little parish history that just calls him an organizer's organizer. He was the one who would have the bank account set up, and the rooms booked, and the press release, and the focus group, and everything kind of lined up. And um, there's some great audio of him speaking. Uh, he's a wonderful orator as well. 
If Hogan gave that intellectual gloss to everything, uh, Roach gave it a moral charge. His language is always, I don't know what the right word is, it's always so, reminds me of John Steinbeck, to be honest with you. I don't think that's, uh, that, that's the right kind of analogy, but there's a sense that uh, there's something bigger here and that the solution to the industrial crisis is actually a solution to the human crisis that's going on. Um, perhaps that comes from his years, uh, from his pastoral duties, you know, searching for that moral core to the problem. So Roach and Hogan, I don't know what their personal relationship was. I don't know if they liked each other or got along. I know one runs for the NDP, one later runs for the Liberal. Those are fighting words from where I come from. Uh, so I don't know anything about you know, the behind the scenes stuff. Maybe some of you, um, some of you do. Uh, I spoke to Bill Roach twice on the telephone. He was, in a, by that point, in assisted living and uh, was gracious enough to take my call and talk a little bit about these things. Uh, he remarked about his time. He actually, he spoke mostly about his time uh, working on, in Member 2 and advocating for equal educational opportunities for the children uh, on the reserve. Um, and he said to me a couple times, everything I have to say is in, uh, is in Cape Breton's magazine. Just go read it. That's all you need to do. <laughs> Uh, so I did, um, uh, and I'd, I'd love to follow up that, those member two stories, but unfortunately, uh, Father Roach passed away just, uh, just last year. I mean, there's other divisions between the two of them. Uh, you know, one is from Glace Bay, one's from New Otterford. I understand now better that those things might, could pull you together, might separate you, I'm not really sure. Uh, but I, I see that there are a number of differences that need to be uh, paid attention to. And both together understood that to talk about the crisis in purely economic terms wouldn't work. Um, they wanted to tap people's feelings. I was in Ottawa not that long ago and came across a, a cache of letters written by Cape Breton school children. If you were in school in 1967 and wrote a letter to Prime Minister Pearson, it's in the archives in Ottawa, and I actually have probably read your letter. I was actually, uh, when I was looking at these letters, I had my phone beside me texting my wife saying, you know so-and-so in your office? Um, did, he, did he go to, I don't know, Eastmount School? Because I think I have his letter to Prime Minister Pearson right in front of me. Uh, and there's neat little tidbits where Prime Minister Pearson is actually sending a letter downstairs to the mailroom saying, I think we need more staff in the mailroom. Uh, there's another bag of letters here from Cape Breton. Uh, and he read some of them. They're stamped, and he signs off on a few of them, and he actually had, had read them. Uh, and all those letters from the school children talk about the island in these mythic kind of terms, about the landscape and the seascape, uh, about their hearts, about their fathers, about their homes. And I think the anti ganesh movement, uh, those involved in the struggle, I think they understood where people's angle of vision uh, was set. And they were able to tap into that, either intellectually or morally, they were able to uh, tap into that. Uh, this is just one of many letters, um, and it's, uh, um, sorry, it's a stupid story, it's a neat anecdote. The letters uh, came in from different schools. So if the letters came in from, say, Glace Bay, the letters often started, my dad's a coal miner, but I sympathize with the steel workers. The letters that come in from uh, Holy Angels always started with a prayer. Um, and then some biblical quote, like, so, like, like some, uh, you know, they were sort of saying, okay, you know, here's what you're up against. And the penmanship at Holy Angels was always way better. Uh, very neat. Oh, the curse of writing is beautiful. Um, uh, so I can just imagine what perhaps the, uh, um, um, what the classroom setting was going to be like. But all of this culminates, if you think back to the uh, Black Friday crisis, it culminates in the parade of concern. Um, uh, here's one of many shots that we have of that uh, monster rally. Estimates put the number of people there between 20 and, and 30,000. Um, this is the rally that features Charlie McKinnon singing, Let's Save Our Industry. Uh, Alan Jay is there, um, uh, but so too is, is, is Bill Roach. He's there, he's the master of ceremonies. And it is he, he that, um, um, that is, or both of them, I should say, him and Andy Hogan, the ones that sort of bring it all together. The Parade of Concern is, is a vital component of the success uh, that is the saving of Sydney Steel. In the short term, it feels like a success. What it feels like later is something, uh, I think, is a different, um, a different kind of calculation, if I can put it that way. But in the short term, it's remarkably successful. I've studied deindustrialization uh, across North America. And it's, it's not uncommon for communities to respond when their plants close. It is uncommon that they actually su successfully convince a government to nationalize something. 
That is extremely rare. And I can't help but thinking that on some level, the long-term relationships between the Antigonish movement on the one hand, as, as embodied by William Roach and, uh, uh, and Andy Hogan, and the relationship with the labor movement on the other are key to that, uh, to that kind of success. So if we just go back to where we started, um, you know, this, the scene uh, inside this house on that Monday morning after Black Friday at first appeared as a real mystery to me. I, I couldn't quite understand why these individuals were doing what they did and why. But by time traveling, by going back to the 1920s and looking at how the relationship evolved, it now makes perfect sense to me. In fact, it would be hard to imagine anybody else at that time with the organizational skills and the moral authority to rally a community around a cause that everybody at the time knew was just. Thanks very much, and thanks, thanks for being such a good audience. I think the, that, the order of operations is fire away, right, Ken? Is that pretty much it? Um, I'm willing to go back to any slide that you want or take any questions or just hear your stories. I'm actually more interested in what some people might remember about that time than, uh, than anything else. But. How many here walked in that parade? That's a good question. How many here walked in that parade? That's a lot. Does that surprise you? That so many hands just went up? No? I thought they would have all passed on. <laughs> <laughs> the, <laughs> that's a joke only you could make. <laughs> The, the coverage of that, that monster rally is, it, it, there's one column in the, I don't know if it was Cape it just lists all the different people and it talks about all the different unions, all the different service clubs, all of the Boy Scouts, the Little League, uh, uh, folks from member to the, the list is, is, is huge. Um, and it, to me it reveals such a, a civic richness uh, in, in the industrial zones in the 50s and 60s. There's so many organizations with so many people involved in them uh, and they all, they all come out. Yeah, go ahead. I'd like to say another thing there. For those who walked that morning or afternoon, I forget what it was, uh, you started alone, your little group, and you went as far as the next corner. Oh, you see, saw two others worm their way down another side street, perhaps. But, and then by the time we got to the hill and you looked back, you could see the men and children and match whirling their way down the street and culminate in that one spot. That one spot. It, was, it, it still stands out in my mind. Well, there must have been a, a, a long time difference between those who f arrived first and at the front of the, the train and when the caboose finally made its way uh, uh, in the back because the, the aerial photographs we have of it, it's, it's a monster. It's huge, the number of people that are involved. I might say that uh, I was just a CBC and Kenny was just a little brother in uh, <laughs> 67. But uh, we covered that uh, for the CBC, uh, that the creative concern and social uh, amendments. And I might say, while I'm on my feet too, uh, Mary Lynch, who was a, right. uh, an employee of the CBC, uh, we used to cover some of the cooperative movement in the local area. Right. Back in, uh, before the, before the trade concern. Did, uh, did you cover it the entire, did you just have someone at the big rally or did you have reporters yeah. kind of out in the field? How, how did you cover well, this that? Was more or less kitchen affairs. Okay. You know, in, in different areas. And uh, I remember one a little bit of that's where my home was as well. And uh, covering the material on that particular time. And I remember Moses, Moses Cody, Top school in Rose Point in the early 20s. Is that and right? My neighbor was a, a student. <laughs> yeah. So you covered the you covered the entire the, the entire presentation there from Moses Cody in the 20s right to, right up to the to, to, that's that's quite amazing and your your reference to Mary Lynch is a very interesting one I I don't know if you noticed but I talked about a lot of men 
And it's a huge hole. In, and this is one of the challenges of writing women's history. The documents that are generally left behind are those that are generated by public events. And given the time period that we're talking about, it was mostly men in those public roles. So it's harder to find evidence of women's participation, even though intuitively you know it's there. So it's a, I don't know if you spotted it, but it's a big, it's a big blind spot that needs to be, as my research goes ahead, that I need, I need to think creatively about how to, how to get at. One way to do that, of course, is to talk to people uh, and have them tell you their stories, because then you get, you get all that, uh, that other layer and you get to, to be more inclusive. Um, there's, yeah, Paul. Uh, yeah, great talk, and others can probably address this better, but I think Ian Terry McClellan, I always understood that she was pretty instrumental in that prayer right, concern. Yeah, I, yeah I, mean, I, I, I mean, I've stressed the uh, anti ganish movement, but I mean, I don't want to. I want, to, I want to play up what they did because I think it is distinctive, but clearly there's many people uh, uh, coming to it. I was speaking to a, a colleague of mine at, uh, at CBU, and she was telling me how her mother was part of the original citizens steering organizing committee that included William Roach. And the more I talked to her, the more the impression I got that there was a, a number of people who came together. It wasn't just the initiative of one person. So I, I wanted to bring out one distinctive feature, this interesting mingling between the two, the labor and the anti ganish movement. But yeah, the, clearly there's lots of people who have a hand in bringing these events off. Yes, right at the back. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, on the premise that the uh, bishop uh, directs his <coughs> priests in hmm. the uh, diocese of anti ganish did your research indicate any breakdown in the harmony between the extension department and the, uh, old, the, the seat in, in anti ganish Yeah. I, I, Absolutely. Um, just on the on the first the first point, it, it takes some convincing. You know, the, the bishop uh, Bishop Morrison, who's in anti in the 1920s, he's not completely sold on this activist uh, Christianity. You know, he's not he's not he's not big on Jimmy Tompkins, and and actually rewards him for his service by sending him out to a to to, to Canso. He goes, yeah, that's a great idea, uh, Jimmy. So why don't you just take that on on the on the road? Uh, but but later, when the when the letters start coming in from the coal fields and and uh, and they're saying, look, you know, there's another issue here. His mind slowly turns, and it's by the early 1930s that they are committed to the urban areas. As things go forward, as extension gets planted here, there's all kinds of disconnect between the Antigonish uh, movement in, um, uh, in, in Antigonish itself and those operating here. Um, I have one story from an interview, and I don't know if it's how true it is, but that weekend between Black Friday and, and the Monday when they're meeting, uh, Reverend Topshi is on the phone to Antigonish saying, you know, this is what we're doing, and apparently he's getting the complete cold shoulder. Uh, they're not convinced they should be getting involved at all. Um, so there is, we shouldn't homogenize too much, if I can put it that way. Uh, there, is some, there is some tension and difference. Um, you know, Sydney, the office tends to go its own way on many, many policies. That's a great question and a relationship I'd like to know a lot more about. Uh, David. And a great talk. And let me go back to your title. What were the... What were the... The counterfeit principles? The counterfeit principles. Yeah, thanks for spotting that. You have the snappy, <laughs> snappy title in the title, and then you don't even actually say the snappy title in the, in the, in the, in the body of the, the paper. Um, that is from a brief that Andy Hogan prepares for the Nova Scotian government. And his argument basically is this, that economics cannot be run by the austere calculus of accountants. His basic point is that there is a human factor here and you have to consider it. So if we live our lives by the, by the counterfeit principles of free enterprise, we will all be impoverished as a result. And he, in that letter, sends up all these reports. He's done them in steel, he's done them in coal, and he's basically sending them off to whoever will listen in Halifax saying this, he keeps saying, this is the human cost of your inaction. So while you might justify it financially, and we can understand why, this is the price we're going to pay. And so for him, the counterfeit principles are basically letting the free market go on its own. And that to me, there's, there's two elements there. That is in part very consistent with the anti ganish movement philosophy, local control, right? Capital that serves people, uh, that's under the people's control. It's also similar to a longer genealogy of regional protests that happens in the Maritimes. 
I hear echoes of the maritime rights movement from the 1920s uh, in that talk saying, you know, we, you go back even further, 1880s when the Nova Scotia elects the first secessionist government in Canada. It, Confederation is a raw deal and we want better terms. I hear those echoes there too. Yeah, David. In your mind, does that help explain why the federal and provincial governments end up nationalizing DEFCO and provincializing Cisco? Yeah, you know, that's... Um, well, that's a very good question. There's, uh, I think there's a few things that line up. I think it's very unique to 1967. There's the overlay of national pride. This is the, this is the centennial year, and you can't let the, the economy of the entire region go down the drain in the centennial year. You know, no one will be singing Canada uh, when it just sinks into the North Atlantic. Um, so there's an overlay there. What's interesting at the federal level, I've been reading the cabinet documents, is they often say the same thing. They say the, the collapse of the regional economy from a policy standpoint cannot be contemplated. What's interesting about the 60s is that the idea of regional fairness is still very, very strong. It's an idea we don't talk about at all anymore. I didn't hear it during the last election or the election before that. So we have regional fairness as an ideal, still powerful in the, at the highest levels of decision making. And that's, a, that's region. And then from the bottom up, we have people saying, hey, this region has taken it on the chin. And it didn't hurt that Hawker Sidley was a foreign corporation. Right? That's, an art, that's, a, that's a case that's easily made. Uh, these foreign pirates have come, and now they've done all this stuff. And now they're back partridge yeah. hunting uh, back in the UK. So uh, just back to, your, back to your point, yes, I think uh, region is key. And I think there's an interesting kind of link between what the people are saying and where people's minds are in Ottawa. And yeah. to follow up, since you mentioned, talk about the centennial year thing. Could there be any insidious nature to the timing of, you know, doing this in 1967 on the part of Hawker Sidley? Is there any evidence of that now? That you mean that they, 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 look, they sat back and thought, ooh, if we do it on the centennial year, we're guaranteed to get a, an expo ashtray and the, the government will. <laughs> You know, that may be giving them too much credit, perhaps. Um, this, I was talking to a colleague of mine, uh, Lachlan McKinnon, who's, I know he's presented to this group before, and, and we, are, we puzzle through the, that period. Hawker Sidley's here in the, from 1957 forward, uh, perhaps a bit earlier. By 67, they're looking to unload, and they haven't done anything in the steel plant for 10 years. So I think from 57 forward, they're thinking this is going to be an aggressive kind of write down. We're going to get every ounce of productivity out of it, and then we're going to pull the plug. So I, I don't know about the timing in the centennial year, but I do think they, they, are, they are not wholly committed to it from the beginning. Uh, and it does, it slowly, it slowly kind of winds down. And once you get Japanese steel and, and German steel and Hawker Sidley wants to make a play in Quebec. I think the, it becomes tougher and tougher for their board of directors to justify keeping it. Um, there's also the murky politics of, of Hawker Sidley International versus Hawker Sidley Canada. And I don't know, and I haven't been able to find the corporate records that would sort that out for me. Uh, yeah, right here. Enjoyed your talk. Thanks. Uh, another uh, aspect that probably drew the extension department and the uh, unions together uh, was mm. the presence in the co-op housing. Yes. If you take a look just in Sydney alone, I would say, well, back uh, around 1975, you would have had 40 to 50 percent of the housing was uh, was co-op housing. And, and of course, there's the liaison. And yeah. Andy Hogan, yep. of course, on, on CJCB, which was a new station at the time, it is people's school. And, yep. And that... That was all part of that, uh, that presence as well. Yeah, that, that's an excellent point. Probably even a stronger uh, link in the chain than some of the examples uh, that I gave. And there, there are those formal cooperatives. Then there's people who, they're the kind of these spontaneous cooperatives. I mean, just over in Ashby on, um, on Cabot Street, there were informal cooperatives there. People just got together, they shared tools, shared power, got the low interest loans, built the houses, then just kind of then dissolved the cooperative. But that's kind of an echo of that, um, um, of that particular movement. We could also add all the various reading rooms and libraries that were set up. Uh, very popular uh, uh, for many, many people. 
Um, uh, there's a, a wonderful anecdote. It's actually, I forget the title, but it's, the book is written by Ken Donovan's brother. It's uh, the biography, oh, what's his name? Yeah, there's a wonderful anecdote in there where, where he goes to a library, uh, uh, an extension department library, and starts taking out books and is captivated by what, by what he finds there. I imagine that kind of that happening uh, for a number of people during that time period. But cooperative housing is a great example. Yeah, right at the back. I grew up on Cabbage Street, by the way. Okay. <laughs> I was at Sydney. You must be amused then. Yeah. Oh. <laughs> Do I not sound like I'm from Cape Breton or what? Yeah. <laughs> I was at Sydney Academy when I was afraid of concern. So I was doing my homework, and my father called from the steel plant, and he said, turn on the news at 5 o'clock or 6 o'clock or whatever, and they were going to make the announcement. Well, that was the end of the world mm. for us. But he had been laid off and, you know, had time off, and he had organized the, the unemployed workers and I remember, I think it was the 64, 65 federal election, uh, Lester Pearson came to Sydney, and you talked about liberal and NDP, when my father was a big NDP. -er. And Lester Pearson, somebody called and said, uh, you can use Lester Pearson, but I'd like to talk to you at the Ottawa Hotel. And he said, if Lester Pearson wants to talk to me, he can come to Cabbage Street. <laughs> 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 I later had to knock on the door, and it was Lester Okay. Uh, he's 91, he's at the cold. His mind is still sharp if, if uh, you'd like to talk to him. Yeah, that'd be great. Uh, I was at Sydney Academy, and there was over 1,600 students at, at Sydney Academy at that time. And we participated. We must have been doing Julius Caesar that year because my memory, the sign that led us said A2 Hawker City. <laughs> 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 Hmm. That's how important that is. So there must have been well over a thousand Sydney Academy students. Out of oh, I can just imagine. So it, it really, really made uh, an impact on us. And, and you're quite right, you know, around the campfire, you still say <laughs> it's, 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 it's a great memory. But um, time marches on, I found that. I was the mayor of CBRM when they made the announcement that Sydney Steel was, was going to close. And it went with a whimper. Wow. Maybe. Yeah, so it circles within there. circles. So my father will, will say today, you know, 19, 19, he wouldn't say it in 1967, but he'll say it today, that maybe if they had given us all a pension, you know, the problem right. would have saved all that, that money. Now, yeah. he wouldn't have said that in 1967, <laughs> <laughs> but he'd, he'd say it today. Well, in, in 19, I, I, I thought in studying 1967, I, I would have found a, maybe a knockdown, drag them out debate where people, there was one side saying, it's, you know, pull the plug, and another side saying, no, you've got to say it. I was, and I, you know, I've looked long and hard for a scrap of evidence where there's any dissent on the question of what to do, and I haven't been able to find it. People may have been thinking it, but I haven't been able to find it. <laughs> well, it's interesting you say that because I actually just recently came across a letter, um, and it is it was a letter to the premier uh, from the owner of the Chronicle Herald, um, and and he says, "Way to go! You did the right thing." Uh, this is Graham Dennis, right? Not not necessarily a friend of Cape Breton in the 1960s, but saying you did the right thing for the province. So. There's a, there was such a unanimity around the issue. Now that consensus breaks down afterwards. And you're right, as, you, as time marches on, you get into the 60, late 60s, into the 70s, when we start appreciating the human health effects, there's a buyer, now no, there's not a buyer, and it's slowly diminishing, and is it there, is it gonna go? It, it changes. Uh, and the first couple of years after uh, it's saved, the, the local papers celebrate Black Friday and the Parade of Concern like a holiday. It's like, remember when, you know, Black Friday is Bright Friday. By the time you get to the early 70s, they're not celebrating it anymore in the editorial pages. There's like, there's been a change in public perception, um, which maybe goes to some of the, the, the thoughts that you expressed um, a second ago. 
Yeah, Charles, hi. Hi. Uh, I'm, I was really taken with your comments about the uh, Anakinish preoccupations and the ones in Sydney mm -hmm. with respect to uh, the activity of the Extension Department. And I'd like to just insert one little um, uh, par par paragraph in my comments. When I was growing up in Dominion, um, people like Dr. Cody, uh, Father Tompkins was pastor in reserve, Mike McKinnon was vice right. president of St. of X, and I had occasion to deal with him there, because I was editor of the yearbook and I had to present it to the president, and he said, he said, thank you. The, the yearbook that I worked for a full year on. <laughs> and that was I it. I was going to say it's a great company. But anyway, um, all these men were very prominent. Mm. The other ones, the younger ones, like Father uh, Roach and Andy Hogan were a bit younger, but of the same caliber. Mm. And I... And thinking about my own life, I know I was influenced a lot by those men. People, uh, young, when I was at St. of X, my senior year, I would say about 20 guys wanted to go to the priesthood, thought about, thought, thought seriously about it. And I, I figured out that it was the influence of these men that uh, 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 prodded them to think about that. I, I acted on it too. But I wonder about. <coughs> As you say, that the the, the uh, effort to keep Sydney Steel going afterwards trickled down the creek, so to speak. And uh, but what about the extension department? Mm. What happened there? Uh, it 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 died more or less. It died. Uh, they still had an office in Sydney when when we established the university. Don Arsenal, will recall this. Uh, there was talk about what would stay here. Money, buildings, books, all that stuff, faculty. Uh, what about the extension department? There was a, a number of people who wanted the extension department to be part of CBU at the time, or whatever it was called. And, uh, but Sandovex wanted the extension department. <laughs> it was like, it was like a, um, a sign that they wanted to hang out. And they take the sign off that building there, not entirely, and put it up at any finish. We weren't to be the extension department. But it died. It, I don't know if it died in any finish. I think it did, but uh, the uh, it became a recruiting center. <coughs> right. It became a recruiting center for or for Saint of X. And that was far below what Andy Hogan had in mind for. Yeah, absolutely. So I'm interested now, uh, th that's asking for speculation. I yeah, think. yeah. But there's a story there. Oh, there is. There's a big story there. And, uh, and when you look at, uh, at, uh, uh, at the university here, we tried as faculty people to do some of the things that, that they had done. They had done. And we were successful with some of them. But it wasn't, we weren't able to have uh, to have that Anakinist thing, which was right. an ideological and, and philosophical uh, claim to, to St. of X. By the way, when I was a senior at St. of X, I was chairman of the board of directors of the Students' co -op. <laughs> And I was, I, I, I was asked to uh, uh, have a little education session. And I invited Dr. Cody. He had his patch over his eye. <laughs> This was in 1959. He died several months later. Right. And uh, I went to meet him, to walk over with him. And he said, he said to me, you look like your father. He had never <laughs> met me before. <laughs> Maybe it was the eye patch. You know. <laughs> and the thing is, he organized the men, the young men in Dominion and the Credit along with a lot of other wow. big places. What a person. What a, what a presence. A man worth imitating. Mm. Thank you. And prolific as a writer and a speaker, and yeah. uh, just amazing. But the, what happened to the extension department? Uh, that's it. It's was a, able to galvanize 
I, I, it's a, you, you put your finger on something I haven't thought my way through entirely. Sometimes I wonder if I should be seeing the actions in Sydney Steel as a sign of strength or maybe a sign of weak, weakness in some way. And I'll just explain. In 1967, no one from the Extension Department is calling for a morally superior cooperative uh, economy to replace what we have. What they're calling for is government intervention to save an industry. That's a very different position than 1920, 1930, 1940, 19, even 1950. So they, they are heavily influenced, but they're operating in a very different framework than, say, rural Canso is not, in 1925, is not the same as industrial Cape Breton in 1967. And you're right, what does it become? Well, there's, I think we do see over time that it becomes more or less, uh, well, there's, there's one big, big surge. 1960s into the 70s, uh, the Antigonish movement is involved in the, in the uh, uh, Micmac uh, a Cooperative Education Program. And they have all kinds of people on several Mi'kmaq reserves in the area. I would say that's probably their last big initiative and drive for cooperative education. And then it ends, all the funding's coming from the Department of Indian Affairs and they just turn off the tap. So you're right, after, I'd say after the 1950s, that that core vision, that Tompkins Cody vision, I'd say it slowly, it changes. It changes as society changes, I think is probably the best way to put it. There was a hand over here, yeah. Uh, in Christmas 2014, I was coming around for uh, a Christmas gift. I went to Buffett's office while in North Sydney and found a book. The book was titled Father Jimmy. And it's a very comprehensive book. I the life and times of Father Jimmy Tompkins and the working gift. <laughs> it's called. Fa is that the one? Is it by Jim Lotz? Is that? Yeah. Okay. Okay. That's wonderful. And uh, I will say before I sit down that uh, there's a work going on presently with Father Greg McLeod. Yes, absolutely. We had a session last year at uh, St. Pat University where he's attempting to establish an agricultural farm. Fantastic. And it, it, it is up and running now where you can buy fresh vegetables from Cape Breton growers and he's trying to grow it. And, uh, That's the food hub, isn't it? Something yeah. He brought the idea back from uh, Korea, and it, it ends in motion. There was a there was an agricultural show at Center 200 during the winter time, and I talked to some people there, and it is up and running. But uh, they've got a lot of work to do, a long way to go. Okay. But, uh, I think the ultimate goal is to try to restore an agricultural industry in Cape Breton. Thank, yeah, thank you. Ken, did you want to? I'd say yes, yes and no. I think on, on, the, on the first point, you see, I see them as similar. The reason, I think the reason why they get, 
they are so aligned in the 1950s is they agree on a couple things, that radicalism is bad, and that Keynesian economics, a kind of a middle way between unbridled capitalism and state socialism is, is the path that we should be on. So I think there's actually greater continuity between the two eras than there are, uh, than there are differences. Just on your first point, yeah, the 1920s are anything, uh, anything but roaring. Um, you know, the Great Depression, you know, we usually think of it starting in 1929. I think it begins here in 1921 and 1922 and only lifts in 1939 with the advent of World War II. Um, so I, I see that, that, that concern over radicalism and whatever you think about that perspective is, would be up for you to, to judge. But I see it as a thin connecting line from 1920 uh, right down to, to the 1960s. Overall, the Catholic Church was pretty conservative, would you say? Well, it depends where you're looking. Uh, you know, during those uh, labor battles of the 1920s, for example, uh, of the 1920s, for example, you might find officials at the very top of the hierarchy being very sort of anti-labor. I mean, J.B. McLaughlin was often publicly vilified for being an infidel and an atheist. But at the local level, the local parish priests were often very sympathetic to the miners uh, and, also, and, and, and others. And, and so it was much more varied, I think, at that grassroots, uh, that grassroots kind of level. I think there is a conservatism around radical politics, especially after World War II, because it's the Cold War. But they can be quite radical in other ways. The cooperative initiative is a, is a radicalism of a kind. So yes, I think there's a, there is a conservatism. I think we have to look at different layers of the church to see how it actually plays itself out. Uh, and we shouldn't underestimate how radical the cooperative movement was uh, on its own terms. So will you touch it in your paper? I'll try to. Uh, I mean, this, o this overall project is focusing on 1967 as a way to understanding the 1960s more generally when the industrial economy here really comes uh, undone. Um, and I think more and more I'm, I have to back into these different kind of debates to get a sense for the texture and the tempo of life during this time period. Um, and it, gets, it really gets back to the point that, that Charles made about what happens to the Antigonish movement. It's a, that's an element of the same, uh, these are part of the same question, I think. Uh, I'll have to sort of deal with that on one level, I think, for sure. Uh, uh, yeah, right here. Uh. Fortunately or unfortunately, <laughs> my dad was there for 37 years and my brother for 43, so my entire life all I ever heard was that. plant talk. And uh, when I went to work there in 52, uh, you started in the mail room. And, right. Uh, my dad ran the big engine and Rod Brown, Rod Carmel, and Rishi Johnny and Long Jack and all these figures that I had heard at the, ki at the kitchen table for the years all of a sudden were three dimensional. <laughs> Thanks. Uh, really, and it's not criticism, but those of us that worked there, the emotional toll that it took on us mm. uh, was uh, very great. I had three small children on Black Friday, and I had my coat on and sitting on the arm of the chair waiting for Bill Jessen to tell us right. what the special announcement was. And uh, I'm working in the accounting department. Of course, we were obviously here in rumors, so we get the big rail order from Brazil, and somehow or another, psyche, I thought that's what it was. And then Ouch. It was like getting hit in the gut very hard when that announcement was made. And uh, three small children, my wife looked at me and she said, what are we going to do? And uh, I said, we got our coats on, we're going to a movie. And uh, <laughs> said, what else could you do? We got to Cheryl Street and it was just ball to wall people. It seemed like a uh, hive of bees that had conjugated on Cheryl Street. And uh, but what happened after that, when, when Opera City took over, the management looked down at those of us that were locals. And uh, I remember when Al Alexander Proudfoot came here, they were going to sanitize and be efficient and all this kind of thing. And, and those people were maniacs. That's the only way I could describe them. They were maniacs. They were there for one reason. They were going to cut staff, which they wouldn't admit to, of course. Right. And, uh, they, it seemed like it was just a, a block 
this block came in and then they got rid of that manager and then they sent in another guy that was equally as bad. So the emotional toll on the people that worked there was, was uh, you were always living in that insert uncertainty and, and Black Friday was just the culmination of uh, all of that. Yeah. Uh, all the stuff that uh, you, you know, there's moments in time that you cannot forget. Hmm. And when Bill Justin came on that screen and made that announcement, that's etched in my memory. Yeah, I bet it is. I, I've spoken to a few people, and it's and it's as vivid today for many people as it was uh, when it, when it first happened. And the, the richness of the detail is is an indication of how the, the force of the impression, just how deep it must have sank at the time. Yeah, right at the back. I wanted to ask you about the letters that you talked about, Father Todd was ready to commission Morrison on these. Yes. And do you feel that that way you've been trying to get him to act? They were concerned about the communism part of the labor movement then because Todd, Todd was certainly, or I'm not Todd, but McLaughlin was certainly a communist. Sure, and yeah. Both, and many of the people in the East Bay were communists at that time. So, uh, and they certainly had a very anti-religious feeling. Absolutely. You know, religion was the opium of the people, I think was their saying. So. <laughs> I think that he, that's what he was trying to warn, and let's get active and blunt that. I, th I, th I think that's, that's exactly, and you expressed it better than I did. That's exactly right. And uh, sometimes, I, though, I wonder if, to what extent, you know, Father, uh, Father Tompkins, you know, he wanted support for what he wanted to do, and whether or not he was sort of ratcheting up the crisis in order to get the bishop to act. Uh, because I've also seen a letter where he turns around, he writes to J.B. McLaughlin saying, well, let's work on this uh, labor school of the people thing. Uh, you know, maybe we could get uh, J.S. Woodsworth to come over and, 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 give a, and give a lecture. So uh, Tompkins didn't like radicals, but he didn't mind dealing with people if they had a practical problem in front of, in front of them. So he was, he was able to at least be nice uh, uh, on paper. But your first point, I think, is exactly right. Uh, uh, that era is... The lines of class and of conflict and the great isms are so starkly drawn that I think he sees both a problem and an opportunity for the Antigonish movement. And that's why he's writing the bishop. Yeah, you're exactly right. I wonder if the other aspect we were talking about could change by the 1950s. Mm -hmm. Like if you look at 1953 or 54, it was not the time they had the big anti communist thing down in the States. Uh, Abs 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 yes, you're exactly right. I mean, the, I mean, by that point, in just in the Canadian labor movement generally, uh, the House of Labor is completely divided between kind of uh, the left and the right, if I can put it that way. So uh, it doesn't surprise me that we see the shading of the Cold War and those anti-communist sensibilities of the 50s influencing people's decisions and creating kind of common ground for people who, you know, at least in an earlier generation, uh, weren't on the same page. So yeah, I think there are these, these pressures of the 40s, 50s, into the 60s bring them around to this, this kind of relationship. And they share it. It's either cooperative housing, or it's labor school of the air, or it's all these other things. These are all the ways they're connected, but they share this, this broader outlook together. Yes, Father Greg. Uh, I agree with what you will say, and certainly. But uh, there's a little side of it. Uh, in the uh, the only one of the big reasons why Colby and Tompkins could do what they do did was because of a terrific network of clergy in different parishes all over the diocese. They could phone up and go and have a meeting in a local pastor, get the people out. Right. And there's a tremendous strength. And even before Cody and Tompkins. Acadian priest, P. Set in Shetty Camp. He organized a cooperative fishing plant about 1915. And around 1905, he, did all, he wanted to, the, the Jersey merchants controlled everything. He wanted to take it back for the Acadians. So there was a, it wasn't just here, it was also international. Uh, there was a movement in the Catholic Church of social justice that began in the 1890s in reaction to communism. But it was all over Italy, Spain, and uh, I committed with some Italy and Spain. And something that is really striking me as you speak, all that wonderful activity, wonderful commitment, what happened to it? Hmm. What, we don't even have a, any cooperative retail stores left in Cape Breton. But in Spain and Italy, there's some very successful cases that did start as part of that, well, they kept on, they didn't keep on here. 
it, effectively it died, the, the economic side. We still got a story, say the wonderful stories, but from an economic point of view, we're just as bad off now as we were in the 20s and 30s and 40s, I think, you know. So uh, I'm really puzzled by that, what happened to everybody in other places I've been looking at in other parts of the world. The same movement, the same principles, and the Pope today is pushing that same line, uh, and uh, it, it has tremendous effect. But anyway, the his history side is very fascinating. It would be interesting to be a little bit more study what happened since then. Yeah, what happened after that? Uh, yes, right at the back. Would you say the movement became as big as it did because of the key players like Cody and Tompkins, or because of the people whose lives were affected by the closure of the steel center? Like yeah, no, that, that's, a, that's, an, that's an awesome question. I think, um, I think the power was in the people, and I think they were ready for action of any kind. So I think there would have been a massive kind of uprising. Uh, I think it took the tone and the direction and the character that it did because of some very key uh, individuals. Uh, from very early on, uh, right at the beginning, you know, Father Roach is saying, we've got to make this more than a steel problem, or we'll have no purchase anywhere else except on the island. So I think that very strategically, when they got involved, they shaped and gave the movement a certain kind of form. Um, I might also say, and I don't, I, don't know, I don't know if I thought this through clearly enough, I think that people were motivated because there was a heritage of struggle here. And it's not just through the labor movement. Uh, even out, outside the labor movement, people were used to fighting and scrapping for what they had. And I think that just the, the echoes of the Antigonish movement were part of that, you know, part of the, the, the residue upon which the movement had some traction. So even as people moved out of their circumstances, you know, as steel workers or not, I think there was sort of a sense of activism that was conditioned by the, uh, by the movement in a more general sense. So yeah, it's a very good question, and it goes to a really tricky one for historians. You know, you know, what's the most influential thing here? Is there a dependent and independent variable that we can tease out and say, this is the key, and no, that's the key? Uh, you put your finger on a real puzzle that I'll have to sort of, eventually I'll have to sort out one way or the other. Yes? Um, in 1967, my uh, father came home um, one day, and uh, he was after working 47 years at he was broken hearted, um, so he had sent him on early retirement. Um, I think with Black Friday, it's more than just the paycheck, and I have to disagree. I do not think that you know, the government offered all of the uh, steel workers a paycheck. That they would have taken it. Have. Right. Um, it was part and parcel of who they were. Uh, and years afterwards, I would go to uh, the shop mall and sit with him when I was a kid and listened to all his friends who were retired steel workers talk with a lot of pride about what they did. Um, it's part of who they were. It wasn't mm -hmm. just a paycheck for them. And today, I, uh, the last 15 years, I had the pleasure to work on the City Steel Museum with a number of retired steel workers. And just sitting there and listening to them tell their story and uh, the light that comes back in their eyes about being part of something that was so special to them. Yeah. Um, much more, and I think that's what drove this movement. Yes. I don't think it was a monetary thing. I think it was taking away part of their identity by just saying it's not anymore. Yeah, I, I agree, and and the identity element is so deep. Uh, the average age of steel workers uh, at that time is much higher than, say, in Hamilton or in Sault Ste. Marie. So people had resumes like that. I worked there for 47 years. My brother was there for 27. My uncle John was there for, for, for 18. These are long genealogies in the same place. Uh, and, I think, and I think that goes a long way to explaining the, the, the response from people. Just back to the question a second ago, I think there would have been a response because of that. It gets these interesting shadings and inflections because of who leads it. But yeah, the, uh, the, ups, the swelling from the, from the bottom is, is very, very, very strong. Uh, and I've talked to a number of retired steel workers and they have that same feeling. They remember exactly where they were, what they were doing, what they were wearing, what they went, what their wife said, what they said to the kids, whether they heard it on the radio or saw it on television, what they did next. 
It's, uh, you know, it's like when, when JFK was killed or the, the space shuttle blew up, there's this, this flashbulb memory and it, all comes, and it all comes back again. And the fact that it does come back so strongly is a testament to the depth of the feeling they felt at the time. Um, a really powerful, charged moment for a, lot, for a whole generation of people here. Thank you, Andy. Thank you, Ken. Uh, I know there's some former steel workers in the hall, Les Chesson, Dennis Chesson, and Fagan Smith. And if there are any others, I would like you to get together with Andy and we'll get a, a picture of you. And anybody that worked at the plant, men or women. And I'd like to get some names and numbers if people want to talk to me. I'd love to hear their stories. Sure. Okay. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> it's getting late. <laughs> Maybe that could be one on one. Uh, yeah, or uh, later, later. Yeah. yeah. On behalf of everybody here and the Old Sydney Society in general, I'd like to present you with this book, The Cape Breton Fiddle Companion by Liz Doherty, with a, a lot of help from other people. Beautiful book, 25 bucks, I think. <laughs> it's, a, it's an amazing book. And uh, That's awesome. thank you very much. Yeah, thank you, Ken. That's awesome. Thank you. And uh, I would just like to say, when a lot of people get the podium, they are, fall in love with their own voice. He spoke for 25 minutes. He wanted to hear what you had to say. So uh, it takes a lot of uh, smarts to do that. And so thank you very much for coming out. Thanks.